Okay, then yeah, warm well, welcome to everyone. Uh, this is one big crowd. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you for having so much interest in uh, this new installment of the Korea lecture. Yeah. Um, very short thing. What's the Korea lecture? Um, there is going to be uh, no academic credit, but obviously, like you know, more uh, credit in terms of contents than we can offer in usual lectures. So um, yeah, thank you all for for being here. <clears throat> A um, few original target things. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for the. Uh, should turn this on. Uh, thanks for the Sucks Society who um, get, uh, got all the advertising out and stuff and uh, also got the whole thing running. Uh, <clears throat> and also, thanks to everyone for being here. And, um, uh, yeah, uh, something else I wanted to say. Ah, yes, um, questions, please just, you know, throw them in. Um, and, uh, yeah, don't wait for me to turn around and see where you are or something. Uh, okay. Any questions before we start? Uh, ah yeah, one thing. Um, so uh, in order to, to fit with the with this one uh, society meeting uh, next week, um, we're going to start one hour later. But uh, yeah, same room, just like on I think 1500 or something we, we will be starting. Yeah, keep an, out, keep an eye out on your emails. We'll send another, you know, we'll release ours if the room does change. We'll ah yeah, uh, in right. case the room changes, we also uh, send that one on. Okay, cool. <clears throat> oh yeah, I should, um, I forgot the email thing. Ah. Doesn't matter. <coughs> okay, uh, let's get started. So, uh, ah, morning. In this lecture, uh, yeah, it doesn't need a whole lot of introduction because we're going to make a nice language. Question to you first, has anyone ever programmed in the language that they absolutely hate it? Eh? Eh, some of them? Whom, whom's of these languages was Python? I should not start a war at the beginning of the lecture, but okay, yeah. So in this lecture, we're going to um, we're going to explore a bit how we actually create a nice language. What makes a language nice? Well, first of all, nice syntax, you know, readable and stuff. And also, a promise from me: the language that we're going to create will be so simple that you will be able to implement it yourself. So, uh, what I want you to do in this lecture uh, is to build your own compilers for the language that we're going to be developing together. All right, so where the task is set, let's start. <coughs> um, yeah, how does, how does computation work? So like in the beginning, um, we had, you know, things floating around and uh, eventually humans got to the point that they said, well, if we organize them, it looks nice. And um, the cool thing is that if we now just sometimes look at part of these things and rearrange them, uh, in the right way, they start to make sense. So, this is what a language does. We have things in our memory, and what we're doing is we rearrange the memory until we find something that makes sense to us. So, we're going to build a language that does exactly this. Um, one sentence that we're going to, to work with, when nothing goes right, oh no, I like to stop it. So, <clears throat> uh, this sentence, Kind of represents what our memory looks like. So when we, you know, put this into tiny, bo uh, tiny boxes, uh, <coughs> uh, well, we currently assume that each word is essentially uh, one, um, one tiny part of our memory. Now, because I don't want to uh, write about this all the time, uh, well, one one of these sentences is going to represent our memory. Now, in order to make some kind of computation, we have to we have to define how we now change our memory. And uh, this is a very simple example of how to do this. These are called formal grammars. Essentially what they say is, um, if we see exactly this thing in our memory, so exactly, you know, the nothing that goes to right, you know, um, then we put this thing somewhere else in our memory or exchange the memory for it, depending on what you want to express. With this very simple, uh, with this very simple style, we can already make computation. Uh, some examples. Uh, I brought a much simpler function. Uh, so yeah, when, when we see exactly a munch and exactly a symbol, exactly an A, you know, we go over to much symbols. So if our memory um, is made out of several symbols and we, we uh, you know, apply these, these rules step by step, we're going to munch the A's and B's. Yeah? Another example, you know, we can transform A's into B's um, with, with just one simple rule. <coughs> now, uh, we want to get a bit more complicated though. So let's look at this rule. Yeah? Let's say we want to make something that swaps part of our memories out with each other. Now that one doesn't directly work because our rule only you know contains a fixed uh, like two fixed symbols, so we only define it for the exact A and B. Um, so if we want to make a swap, 
functions, for example, we need variables. So kind of placeholders for bigger parts of our memory. <coughs> um, let's switch to this sentence because it has less special signs in it. Um, in case nothing goes right, then go left. Now, uh, this is what we want to express. So uh, we want to we want to definitely say okay, case and then is something that we're going to be reusing at some point. Um, but like uh, we, we're going to be reusing that for for bigger arguments or something. And the first thing uh, that we need is to get rid of some ambiguity. So uh, what we're doing is uh, we introduce brackets for getting rid of the ambiguity what we put into these um, variables. When we now look at uh, how this is represented, this is uh, it's called an abstract, abstract syntax tree. So when you have your language, something like this will kind of pop up in your in your compilers, <clears throat> and this is kind of like our memory, like we had it before. Only that now we have something called pointers. Eh? So like we cannot only store things, but also locations onto other parts of our memory. Um, yeah, and so everything that's in, in a bracket becomes uh, in our abstract syntax tree kind of like a note like this. So for the people that don't know too much about compilers, why would a compiler build something like this, for ah. example? Yeah, that is because uh, in the next example we can see it's very easy to represent variables like this. So a very, like when, when, we have a, when we have a variable somewhere, we only you know, need to look into this graph until this very point, and everything below it you know, is kind of somewhere but we don't need to care for it. So variables make a very neat way such that we do not need to look at our entire memory at the same time, but give our memory some kind of structure of you know what we want to what we want to specifically look at. <coughs> and um, yeah, we can do that at arbitrary positions, right? So um, essentially, when, when I put a variable somewhere, it's kind of like either cutting the tree or uh, you know just having like a placeholder for something that's already in the memory. Uh, <coughs> Uh, yeah, in uh, in real memory it looks a bit different, right? So we, we in the beginning we said like memory is just like one one string of things. This is pretty easily representable by um, saying okay, well we have like kind of a list, and somewhere we have pointers onto you know sublists and stuff, and that is the the entire structure. Um, <coughs> and yeah, in the end in the memory this is kind of flattened like this, so. Um, yeah, in our memory it kind of looks unreadable, but all these things that we just saw, they represent nothing else than just readable sentences. Um, does any, like, is anybody reminded of something when they see such a structure? Um, I personally, like, for me, it, it, I'm, I'm kind of being reminded to, uh, like, a go-to program <laughs> control flow. Does it, uh, who knows what a go-to, uh, or like, what, a, what an assembler or go-to program is? Ah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> So, go to program is nothing else than we have we have a chain of commands if you want, right? And we're just going to operate one command after the other one until we have like a split, so an if and else if you want, right? And we can then jump onto arbitrary locations in our in our code, right? So um, this is just a neat way of um, <coughs> uh, representing how the structure does. Um, who doesn't know who what the go to program is? Um, Google it. And then never use it. So, uh, yeah, obviously uh, modern languages do not have the go-to in them anymore because it makes the code absolutely unreadable. So, um, yeah, eventually we'll find a way of how to, you know, make our nice statements into something um, that automatically is being translated into a go-to or assembler program. Okay, <coughs> but moving on to our uh, uh, to our uh, sentences here. Now, this is the structure that we have here. If we want to uh, express the same uh, hierarchical structure now with only sentences, we can do it something like this. So we can assign values to variables, which are again just sentences. Uh, okay, this is uh, yeah, it fits, it still fits. Good. So what do we do now um, uh, with when we have, for example, two sentences that are rather incomplete? So two parts of our program kind of know something that another part doesn't. Uh, <coughs> yeah. um, what we can do is we can merge them to get the complete sentence in the end. So, at the point where you know um, uh, uh, you know the, the, the case matches, the then matches, and then we know okay this variable um, 
This term is bigger, you know, so it has more knowledge. So kind of this stuff goes into the variable and goes into the final sentence, and we can assign the variable. Just as here, um, you know, the then go left. In this case, this part is bigger. It goes into this variable, goes down here. Um, this is, this will be our main um, <coughs> our main focus of computation. So like the main computational operation will be this term matching of you know taking several information, matching them to something bigger that makes more sense. Um, because it's important, uh, there are several ways how to look at it. How I like it um, is you know when when you have these incomplete uh, these incomplete uh, abstract syntax trees, um, and you kind of put them onto each other uh, at the point where the point where they match. You know <coughs> this is what what makes the match, and then they're just like completed by the information that was missing. <coughs> Okay, uh, and yeah, another way is like, you know, if you write them onto each other, you know, there's several ways how to make this. Okay, uh, any questions to this graph matching algorithm for now? Uh, yes, please? What happens if you match like similar bits and then it leads to like different bits? You get what I mean? Exactly, then the bit, uh, then the, the match um, fails. Ah, okay. So um, uh, the, the match is kind of a trial, so like if something matches, yeah, then something else happens. This will be our if-then construct in our language later on. Thank you for the, thank you for the question. Okay, so, uh, oh yeah, <coughs> one other funny thing. Um, uh, equal variables stay equal after the match, right? So if this is just a term, ignore that this is a, an equal sign, could be whatever. If this is just a term and we try to match this one into it, right? The word matches into the x. Um, and after the match, the, the x needs to stay the same. So if you match these two, we can actually copy parts of our memory to somewhere else. <coughs> uh, yeah, this can be done arbitrarily often, you know, double, triple, or when we want to do something more, uh, more, more fancy, you know, if we have a Kiri and she's probably fast and she's strong and she's best in the fight. Uh, so yeah, if we, uh, if we now put uh, a, 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 concrete, a concrete sentence into the variable, yeah, match it with this one, through the matching, uh, the, the information is being uh, is being uh, uh, yeah it, it, it traverses to the to the other equal uh, equal variables and then we we end up with something that is probably more meaningful. One funny structure is that works in both directions. So if you have this example where this is the term where, that we are matching, you know we already Bob is fast, is strong, and fresh from the fight. Yeah, these three are equal, so this one matches up here because the equalities are still in place. And then we can, you know, uh, assign the x to Bob, and then you know, um, uh, Bob becomes our hearing. <coughs> okay, I want you to actually build this uh, uh, this, this matching algorithm. This is, uh, I think, like a very good practice, um, and it will be a very good foundation for uh, for building a programming language. Um, yeah, um, if you think it's easy, uh, that's me having tried it. Uh, it's actually harder than it looks. There's a lot of like kind of special cases, but uh, we won't go through them here because uh, you are going to see them. Fine, you're going to see them when uh, when you actually do it, right? And I also succeeded eventually. So, <coughs> how do we make now computation? You know, we want to do uh, some some reasoning over several steps, yeah, several modifications to our memory, and um, this would be a very easy thing. So, for example, if if this is our program, the first part, right, and this is kind of a query. So we, we want some answer from our program. We could say, okay, we, we just observe the variable y that you know then contains our answer, and then we just match these two, and then the y contains our answer, right? Problem solved. Um, does anyone see see an issue with this one? This only works one time, right? So like if we have uh, if we want to apply several rules after each other. In here, we just kind of stop up to the first one, and it's really cumbersome to get several rules in. So we need to come up with something smarter in order to make computation that actually goes over several, uh, several steps. Uh, I brought in an example of what we can now express in our in our nice language. Um, it's essentially <coughs> searching something in a list. So we want to find Alice in the list of Bob, Carl, and Alice. Um, I just put a means to make it give some meaning, but yeah. So uh, here we have the variable that contains. Um, whether something is in the list or not. So, <coughs> uh, obviously, you know, if we search for something in an empty list, it's not in there. Um, if we search for something and it's at the beginning of our list, we know it's in there. 
But if we then just write, uh, well, if it's not at the beginning of the list, it kind of has to be in the end of the list, that's nice, but that's not our answer. So, um, we're going to introduce a new symbol, this one, I pronounced if. Uh, so yeah, uh, we find x in y and z, uh, uh, if it is the case that we find x in z, because, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't y. Uh, and then we know it's in there, we know, okay, in there is then the, the, the final answer. Same for here, you know, if it's not in there, not in there is also the final answer. And as you can see, you know, the answer kind of stays the same, so <coughs> we're just going to uh, abbreviate this a bit uh, of actually using the same answer variable. And then we only need to observe this term, and everything that you know, comes in here, this can be done in the back of our minds of our computers, and um, <coughs> yeah, uh, we, we can do some computation with it. Let's see how this looks on the bigger picture. So this is our knowledge base. This is the query that we that we make. Um, uh, this, uh, yeah, this is our variable. I mean, just for some vocabulary, these things up here, they're called facts, and these are called rules. Um, <coughs> uh, just, yeah, for vocabulary. So let's see what happens on this query. Um, very sorry, uh, this is, um, I couldn't make this any smaller, so if you can still read it, my apologies. Uh, yeah, so we have this query here. Uh, and the access to variable that we want to have. Now, the first step that our program does is it matches this against uh, against our knowledge base. So this is also where it comes in. Uh, these matches can fail. So you know when um, when the uh, when when the static symbol or like the, the atoms are called when they don't match, um, the match is not in here. But we have several positions at which we can you know uh, match and find a rule. So uh, find Alice, Bob, Brown, Alice. Uh, you know, it doesn't match on the first three because, you know, Alice is not at the beginning, but it matches on this one because then we couldn't put, you know, Y into Bob and uh, X, you know, in Alice, obviously, Z into the rest list, which would be called in Alice, right? <coughs> and now what we're doing is we just take our query and then this part is now also at another part of our memory. And this is where we run the program again. So, um, we match this part. Yeah, the variables here are shared, so like you know, they, they, they keep the same variables. This one goes into a memory, and um, <coughs> now we continue from here with a shorter list. Nicely. Um, so we're going to do this again. Again, Carl is not at the beginning of uh, Ed is not at the beginning of the list, so we do that again. This thing is now here being put again on, uh, onto the memory. But if you say, see here, find Alice in Alice. Now we actually found Alice, and this rule here holds. So my x in x uh, means you know in there. The matching now extends the in there, puts it into the x, and the neat thing is we always we, we had the x, it was the same all over the whole computation, meaning that the answer that we had now traverses back, traverses back to the original sentence, and we're only observing the original sentence and see well this is our answer. Okay? Who's still with me? <laughs> okay. Wait! Right. Still gotcha. Alright. Um yeah, and uh, as every good drug company, the first thing when uh, advertising a project is I'm going to get you addicted to it. So let's look at awesome things that we can actually uh, express with this language. <coughs> um, this is uh, an example of how to do like basic arithmetic. There is a way of how to express it like this in our language. It's a bit more complicated. Um, uh, so I, I skipped it here, but essentially we say a number is either zero or a number that we add one to, right? So that's the natural numbers. Um, <coughs> now the rule that we have is if we add zero to something, it just stays to something, obviously. And this one, uh, I think it's cooler if we read it backwards. So like, well, okay, if we already know that uh, y and x and z um, is a correct computation, right? We can also say, well, if we if we add one to z, we have to add one to either y or x. In this case, it would be a, it would be y um, to still form a good computation. Uh, here it's pronounced differently, so if you know y plus 1 plus x equals sub, uh, z plus x um, is correct, if you know that combination is correct. Anyway, let's match this here. So, Alright, then let's have a look at what actually happens if we put this query into there. So, <clears throat> we want to you know, ask for the solution of z plus 1. So, the first action, or like the first fact, does match because you know the left hand side just isn't zero. So this rule has to match. Now the suck 
matches on the sock, right? Uh, the X just matches on this part, and uh, our output variable now has to match on this thing, so it is being extended by the additional knowledge that we have in here. And then, you know, what has matched to these, these variables is then put onto, onto the next step of our memory. Now, in this query, uh, we, will, we will see, okay, well, the first rule still, it still doesn't, doesn't match because the left-hand side isn't zero. So, we match again. You know, the two sucks match together, the y matches to the zero, uh, the x matches to this part, and again, we extend our, uh, our solution. Uh, <coughs> obviously, if we now put the extension into the, x y, uh, into the x prime, it is automatically propagated up. In, uh, into the memory. There we go. So, now we actually finally have the, ze the zero on the left hand side, so our first fact actually matches. And if the first fact matches, uh, on the left hand side, uh, right hand side of the uh, equality, uh, the same variable has to, has to occur. So, this such zero is now being copied into the x double prime and then propagated up, and then we have our solution. Alright? Now I know, this solution, it kind of sucks a lot, right? <coughs> but, we are now going to have a look at another very similar query um, that shows the strengths of our new nice language. Let's look at this one. Now, we are, we are given the result of the computation, but we are missing one of the arguments. It's a pretty common task in mathematics, so <coughs> let's see how our algorithm actually performs. Now. Uh, the first rule doesn't match because uh, this part here, uh, is, so you know the the the, uh, the two parts on the on the equality, they're not the same, right? Uh, the suck zero doesn't match uh, the the long uh, suck list. So again, our second rule has to match again, and now from the result, the first successor matches, and the z becomes uh, the successor chain after that one. Uh, the x again just matches to the stack zero, and our variable is extended by the additional knowledge that we have uh, about <coughs> the the left hand uh, yeah so the left hand side. So again we have a we have a variable that that matches on both sides, and the z is being transported. Here again uh, our our rule matches so. <coughs> We have uh, the suck that matches to the first suck of the suck zero, and we again extend our x by uh, the <coughs> by what's written in the rule. So, and now it becomes interesting because we now actually can match the first fact because the suck zero is the same as the suck zero on the right side of the uh, of the equality, and so uh, the x prime needs to become zero. And then it propagates up, and then we have the solution. Now that's awesome, right? Because we can actually put these uh, these question marks of these variables at an arbitrary position, and our language still kind of manages to figure out uh, what to put in there. And so, <coughs> uh, the new slogan of our language could be: Write your program once, operate it in any direction. Let's look at a more real-world example of where this because uh, where this comes into play. This one, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit cumbersome. Uh, <coughs> this is essentially an assembler. So, uh, in an assembly language, we also have a memory, you know, a list of things. But this memory contains commands, like for example, you know, an addition, uh, subtraction, uh, uh, jump, or something. And we initially have a program pointer, pro or program counter, it's called, that says. Um, at which position we get the next command. So what this just does it, it takes the command out of the memory, operates it, and then moves on to the next command. So this is what we're going to do here. We uh, first get the content of, of memory uh, from uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we get the content from the memory at position p, uh, at position p and then execute this command. Um, uh, and yeah, once we execute it, 
it. So, so this is just an example. So the addition, you know, it has two um, two pointers into the memory, and we get the content in the memory at these pointers. We add we add these contents, and then the result is being stored into the third pointer, and the uh, program counter is um, is added, so like uh, traverses to the next command. Something similar to this will be put into the other will be done for the other commands as well. Um, long story short, in the end, this kind of looks like this. Uh, I just wrote a tiny program that actually continuously operates the memory, uh, and in the end, it looks like this. So our memory is just a list, you know, with all the commands in them, and <coughs> this one checks. Well, if the pointer if the point is at a halt, the program halts and the, the result is being read out. Otherwise, um, it's just like you know the um, the next command is being taken and executed. So, what we what we do here, you know, set the program counter, run the program, and put our search variable to the solution. Uh, no, maybe can, you can already figure out what the solution is. I can't, so I kind of am cheating. Uh, it's fifteen. Uh, <coughs> now, this time we set uh, we set the variable that we were asking for at the solution, which is you know kind of a straightforward thing. But what happens if we actually put the uh, the variable at this position? Now the variable is at the point where the program was, meaning that our language now automatically searches for the program. That is producing the value 50. This is cool, right? Because now we have a very um, uh, <clears throat> an arbitrary tool uh, and, and a programming language that can code for us. <coughs> now this is a kind of boring example, but um, this actually becomes practically relevant at uh, at this example. So we're searching for a program. And we're giving the program different input strings, and output is something like you know flower, teddy, car, or something. This is a classification problem, meaning that we just say, okay, like find a pro program that on the input of a flattened image outputs the label that uh, that this image is supposed to be associated with, and the program has to obviously um, uh, output the right label for any input. So we now are given a, a, a way to do machine learning without neural networks, without any kind of statistical analysis or something, um, but just with something that comes naturally out of our language. So yeah, take that machine learning. <laughs> Another example that I personally really like, um, my, my hobby is language learning. So uh, yeah, if you want to learn language, you know, just write its grammar into our new nice language. Not only do you start coding then in your new language and learning it incredibly quick, but also in the process you are building a speech bot, you know, so you can have someone to communicate with in the new language. <coughs> okay, now we have seen what we're doing. Topics. How, uh, where is this lecture going to go? Now, none of these type of... Uh, None of these topics is, uh, is put into stone, so like, you know, please give me some feedback on what you're interested in. But my plan is currently to, next week, uh, look a bit at types. Types are a, a method of how to check whether our own code is correct, right? Nifty thing. Very closely related to that is the field of proofs, which are there to check whether our types are correct. Just kidding. Um, so yeah, types and proof, they're both, uh, both ways how to check whether our program actually do what, what they intend to be doing. Next one, search. Yeah, as you can see, uh, <coughs> our language does a lot of search parts and uh, you know all these, these nifty features wouldn't work if we hadn't got a proper search engine. So this is actually my favorite topic. Uh, yeah, so search, um, we, will, we will be looking at how to do search in a way that is not stupid. Another thing, ambiguity. Uh, this is interesting when we want to make our language more natural. You know, natural language has a lot of ambiguity in it, and we uh, could have a lecture on how to get rid of the ambiguity or, to, uh, or how to handle with it, or how to handle it. And the last one would be translation. 
Uh, this one is interesting because we need to get our language translated into machine code in a way that it is still fast. One of the things that is always uh, said about logical language or time repeated language or however you want to call them is that they're slow, but that's absolutely not the case. So we're going to build a system that does this translation in a way that this is going to be fast and correct. And if you count it, there's one more lecture left, so I'm going to use this as a, as a, as a bit of a buffer. And yeah, maybe that's just that weird Christmas episode or something. <coughs> okay, some quick review. What have we learned? So we've seen our memory is kind of made of tiny bits that we kind of organize, and when we shuffle them around with a programming language, we can make sense of them. We're going to do so by, you know, uh, describing it with languages, with, with sentences, sentences are part of our memory, and using pointers, we can even have such an abstract syntax tree that makes it easier to work on sentences. Uh, we had a method how to have two incomplete sentences be put together to form a complete sentence, and we did so using a term, uh, a term matching algorithm that kind of you know matches these terms together and uh, fills out. Um, uh, the knowledge that uh, was missing between the two terms. And uh, last but not least, we had some rules, and with these rules, we could make some computation. And from that, we actually created a nice language that we can use to, uh, to formulate other languages and, um, you know, uh, get the nice syntax that we can possibly achieve, or that we can currently achieve. Okay, all right so far? Good. And yeah, then only one more thing towards the end. Uh, I personally always thought about why is it that the programming languages that we're using are so incredibly complicated? And uh, there's a reason for that. <coughs> now, this is a normal human readable sentence. But for some reason, the convention of how to do languages has always been that we take this sentence but we write it in kind of this form. So we write the first sentence at the beginning, then we open bracket, you know, and then all the following words are kind of comma separated in them. No idea why we did that, and to be honest, there's no real reason why we should do that. But yeah, what, uh, what, uh, what makes us from, you know, perfectly sense-making sentences? Up until now, let's look at our grammar, uh, or at, at, at our language, and the only thing that we needed to get rid of a bit of ambiguity is to put some brackets, you know, not too many, and it still looks pretty nice. Now, if we use the sentence rule and put the brackets according to this one, it starts looking incredibly weird, right? <coughs> so, there's a lot of brackets that are being, uh, being put in between, some, some commas and stuff, uh, but at least, like, the order of words is still preserved. Still, though, this is not what we can express in normal languages. You, uh, uh, in, the, in the languages you actually see out there, uh, you cannot have function names that are a complex term, right? So we have to rearrange this to kind of, you know, fit fit the uh, fit the constraint that function names cannot be cannot be complex, and this makes this sentence and total absolute bullshit. So yeah, welcome to everyday languages. You're going to, uh, this is this is how we currently write code, and this is how we want to write code, and this is how you soon will be writing code. And that's all for me. Well, thank you, and ladies and gentlemen, unbelievable, your attention, please, questions, ask, if any.